and then they get to a more normal bicarb. And I say normal in quotes because you know as well as I do, sometimes normal bicarb for a COPD is 32. So you want them to go from 40 back toward their normal. Um, the other point to make about this is I'm sure you guys all have patients with glaucoma. You probably also have similar patients with CKD stage 3 and stage 4. Gee, maybe they need a different glaucoma drug if they're a stage 3, 4 CKD patient. They need their bicarb. They don't need to be wasting it, and it's an unintended consequence of the drug when you're treating glaucoma. Does that make sense? Good. Okay, so we're done with the proximal tubule. So let's move on to the thick ascending limb of Henle. That's right here. Thick ascending limb. This is the blood side. This is the tube side. As on all cells of the body, you have a sodium potassium ATPase. And this guy is whole purpose is to keep intracellular sodium low and intracellular potassium high. Do you guys know how low and how high? The numbers really don't matter. What matters is that it's roughly reciprocal to plasma. So your plasma has a sodium of 140. Your intracellular sodium here is about 20. Your plasma has a potassium of 4, 5. In here, it's 150. So it's roughly reciprocal to the values that you see in plasma. This is important because it drives a lot of the uh, absorption in the tube. <coughs> so by the time you get out here to the thick ascending limb, your sodium concentration here is somewhere in the, about the 80 range. Your potassium concentration is somewhere in the 4 to 6 range your chloride concentration somewhere in the 70 to 80 range. Okay? These are kind of ballparks. Don't learn them. Just learn the idea. And so how you absorb sodium here is by a multiple seat transporter. It's got a sodium. Hmm. Let's try this again. Sodium, chloride, potassium. Two chlorides. So you have two pluses and two minuses. I have a reasonably equal amount of sodium and chloride, but I sure don't have as much potassium to fill that seat. And all the seats have to be full for this transporter to put everything inside the cell. So what happens is the potassium recycles. Dad nab it. Try a different one. <laughs> I got a lot of choices here for colors. So what you do here is you recycle your potassium. This channel, have you guys heard of ROM-K? Renal Outer Medullary Potassium Channel. When you read the literature, you'll see capital R, capital O, capital M, capital K. This is it right here. Um, and it's nothing special except that you can find ROM-Ks in other tissues as well. So what happens is I fill up all those seats, but I'm going to run out of potassium. So I have to recycle my potassium. What happens when you recycle potassium here is that this, two pluses and two minuses, is electrical neutral. As soon as I kick out the potassium to recycle it, I have created a voltage change. And that voltage change means that it's more uh, positive out here, more negative in here. <coughs> this serves a purpose. It means that I can non-specifically absorb some positive ions. Which positive ions? Magnesium and calcium. calcium. Right, very good. So the magnesium and calcium come this way. Magnesium, calcium, and even a little sodium will come this way. Are we good? So this is the rationale behind using something to block this so I don't generate this voltage change, and the calcium and the magnesium instead will go into the toilet such as when you're trying to treat somebody with hypercalcemia and you want to waste calcium. So the drugs that work here are the loop diuretics. I know you guys know this. They sit on the chloride seat, and we have a few of these. We have furosemide. We have bumetanide. Boy, this ain't so hot either. Bumetanide. Uh, torsemide. <coughs> torsemide. Uh, 
hyaluronic acid. Those are your loop diuretics. Why do we need four of them? Don't they all work by the same mechanism? Yes, they all work by the same mechanism. That's the first point. They all sit on the chloride seat. They all work by the same mechanism. So why would we use different ones? Let me run through this. Ferrosamide is my personal favorite. We've been buddies for 30 years, me and vitamin L. Vitamin L is cheap. It's a wonderful drug. It's very easy to use. So what are the limitations of ferrosamide? The most important limitation for you all to recognize is that it's not the most reliably absorbed drug on the planet. So when I see people coming into a hospital who have Lasix 20 milligrams a day as part of their regimen, I just shake my head. Only half of normal people, half of normal people will respond to 20 milligrams. You aren't treating normal people. I don't get 20 milligram dosing. On the other hand, if you started there and it seemed to work brilliantly, it's hard for me to cast bricks. But I usually start at a dose of 40. Who is going to have trouble with absorption? Uh, besides the fact that it's just not reliably well absorbed, people with bowel edema are going to have trouble absorbing the drug. So that's your heart failure patients, your cirrhotic patients, your nephrotic patients, your malnourished patients with very low albumins. They're not going to respond very well to Lasix. Furthermore, remember that Lasix is very protein dependent for its trip to the kidney. So Lasix has to be bound to albumin to be delivered to the site of action. If your albumin is 2.2, not only is it not likely to be very well absorbed, but the taxi ride is very inefficient. So maybe Lasix is not the best choice of loop diuretics for that kind of patient. Does that make sense? Now realistically, in the clinic, when this is a cheap drug that works very well, and I have a patient with bowel edema, and I'm proposing that they're not absorbing their 40 very well, a lot of times I'll just go up to 80 and see if I can make that work for them because it's so much cheaper than the other options. So there's reasons to try to push that dose anyway, and most of those reasons are related to cost. Bumetanide, the claim to fame is that it is not as dependent on the taxi ride from albumin. So if you have a patient with lousy albumin status, bumetanide may work better than ferrosamide. Um, for bumetanide is also a little bit more reliably orally absorbed. So you get two of those factors that make Lasix less desirable, you get them better in Bumex. Both of these drugs can be given by IV drip and they can be titrated, which also makes them very handy drugs to use. Torsamide, the only claim to fame for this stuff is that it is absolutely reliably orally absorbed, no matter what your bowel edema status is. It's also 10 times more expensive than ferrosamide. The patients that I have a handful of patients on torsamide, they're all heart failure patients. They're all people with chronic levels of edema. Which heart failure patients? My right heart failure patients, the one who gets so uh, plethoric and, and edematous and uh, hepatic congestion. Those are the ones who seem to benefit from torsamide the most. These top three drugs are all sulfa drugs. Do you have to worry about that in a sulfa allergic patient? Mm -hmm. You have to think about it. I don't want you to get too cavalier, but the sulfa moiety in all of these molecules is tucked on the inside of the quaternary structure. It's not sticking out there to be recognized by the body very easily. If you had somebody who had anaphylaxis to Bactrim, um, I would still try one of these drugs, but you can sit in my office for the day while you take your first dose and I can make sure you don't react to it. But most people will get away with this. Have I ever seen true sulfa allergy in a diuretic in my career? <clears throat> Probably. How many times? Less than five. So you will get away with this most of the time. Don't be cavalier and a bad reactor, but usually the sulfa moiety is not going to be sticking out to get you into trouble. Epicrinic acid is the only one here that's not a sulfa. This is an old time drug, been around forever and ever. So you think to yourself, oh good, generic, easy to find, cheap for the patients. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Don't ask me why, but this stuff is more expensive than Lasix. It's harder to find if you have a patient you give a prescription to. They may call you and say, I've tried three drugstores and I can't find it. So this is not as easy to use or as to, to afford to use or find as you might think. This one also comes in an IV form, though. So if you really have one of those diuretic allergy patients, you could use epicrinic acid drip to try to get them diuresing if you had to. 
So let's talk just a little bit about dosing. Um, I'd be bolus. Yes. Sorry, no. Uh, using epicritic acid and uh, Lasix uh, together. What are your thoughts on that? Nonsense. <laughs> so now tell me why you asked. Cardiology services. Absolutely. So, <laughs> so I, when I came to this institution in 1995, the cardiac surgeons had this recipe that they called the renal cocktail. So what's in the renal cocktail? Mannitol, furosemide, epicrinic acid. That makes no sense. It makes no sense. So I know you see it out there. Don't pick up that bad habit. It makes no sense. And furthermore, when you give that cocktail to somebody, you're making a real leap that they're going to diurese. What happens when you give somebody mannitol who's not going to make urine? Pulmonary edema. Does that make sense? Because it's an osm. You, you mobilize interstitial fluid to the vascular space, and now you've got somebody in pulmonary edema. So I would never do all that stuff together. But separately, try, uh, sequentially, I can buy all those, but all together I really don't get it. And I thought this institution was almost broken of that, and it's not quite gone yet. Thank you for asking. <laughs> it means I can get on my soapbox a little bit. Um, so let's talk about bolus dosing versus drip dosing. Um, I am not afraid of Lasix and Bumex. I will give pretty big doses. I think most of you know the Bartschman rule, 40 times creatinine. If you need to give somebody diuretics to get them on a pulmonary edema, you do not have time to screw around. You want to pick a dose that's going to, you're pretty sure is going to work. So pick a good dose. But then when people start responding and they're slowly getting out of trouble, should you give them repeated IV big boluses or should you put them on a drip? How many say bolus? How many say drip? Gee, everybody, 98% abstention? <laughs> Well, think about this. The side effects of loop diuretics are vestibular and auditory. And the side effects all occur when you get peak levels. That all happens up here. So if you give 180 of Lasix three times a day, these are all the places where people are going to get side effects. Whereas if you give an 80 or 120 milligram bolus and then a drip, the area under the curve is the same with less peaks, less side effects. And the one thing I really hate about practicing medicine over the last 30 years is you save the day. You got the patient better. Too bad they lost a leg from the pressors. Too bad they ended up on dialysis because of the chemotherapy. You see what I mean? I don't want people wobbly and on walkers because I overshot with diuretics. We need to be longer vision. Take care of the patient as best you can today, but try to avoid some of the crap they're going to have to live with the rest of their life. So I think that drips make a lot of sense. If you've got adequate access, drips make a lot of sense. Um, let's see, what else can I torture you with here? Questions about loop diuretics? These are your friend. Don't be afraid of loop diuretics. Don't be afraid to start at a dose of 40 milligrams of Lasix. And remember that Lasix is 40 equals one of Bumex. So if you transition back and forth, you have sort of an idea in your mind. Um, I guess the other thing I probably should say while I'm here is that there's been some bad press over the last five or six years about using saline and loop diuretics for calcium diuresis. They say it's very dangerous, you'll cause electrolyte abnormalities. The short answer is sure, you will if you're not paying attention, but you're going to pay attention. When you have somebody with a calcium of 15, you're giving them saline, you're giving them a loop diuretic, you're trying to waste calcium, you know their mag's gonna go down, you know their potassium's gonna go down, you're going to watch those things and you're going to replace them as needed. So don't be afraid to do this for the hypercalcemic patient either. Make sense? Mm -hmm. I get why the literature wants to throw out warnings, but it's making people afraid of a therapy that works very, very well. Okay, on to the distal tubule. Distal tubule. <laughs> so here we are, magically, the distal tubule. The distal tubule. 
over here, you absorb 5 to 8 percent of your sodium. So the diuretics that work here are not nearly as potent as the loop diuretics. The transporter here is a two-seater. It's sodium, one sodium and one chloride, again electrical neutral, so a plus and a minus. The other thing that gets absorbed in the distal tubule is calcium. And this happens oops, calcium, through calcium channels. The calcium comes in, it gets buried across the cell by vitamin D dependent proteins. And it gets excreted out the back door by a calcium ATPase, ATPase, and a calcium sodium exchanger. Calcium sodium. Okay. The diuretics that work here, again, sit on the chloride seat, and these are your thiazides. So if I block the chloride seat, then I don't take up sodium into the cell. The unintended consequence of this is that if I block sodium absorption here, but I can sort of chronic sodium being pumped out of the cell by my sodium potassium ATPase, what will happen over time is the sodium concentration will fall. The sodium concentration needs to be maintained reasonably stable. So as this level begins to fall, guess what happens? This guy revs up so that sodium will go back into the cell to maintain the sodium concentration. And what this does is it enhances calcium absorption from the tubule. Does that make sense? This is one of the mechanisms that the thiazides will help you in calcium stone formers who have too much calcium in their urine. The second mechanism by which this diuretic will help you is it'll make your patient just a little bit pre-renal. If I make you guys pre-renal, what happens is you absorb more proximally. So more of your calcium is going to get absorbed here, and you're going to absorb more here than you ordinarily would. So you decrease the amount of calcium in the urine and hopefully decrease the tendency towards stone formation. Does that make sense? The calcium channels. The number of calcium channels here is PTH dependent, and then I need vitamin D dependent proteins to ferry them across the cell to their exporters. So for the kidney to absorb calcium appropriately, I need both PTH and vitamin D. Are we good? Thiazides, anything special I want you to know about them? They're sulfas too, the same thing I said about loops. The sulfa's on the inside of the quaternary structure. It's not <coughs> sticking out there to be an antigen, and you'll usually get away with it. Um, you guys have heard about xeroxalin, metolazone being added to Lasix. Mm -hmm. What's so special about metolazone compared to hydrochlorothiazide? The Say it again. It potentiates Lasix if administered 30 minutes. But they both will. So why do, we, why do we sort of preferentially go to metolazone? This is a small point, you guys. It has the best affinity for the chloride seat. So if you have an intubated patient with an ileus, uh, can you give IV hydrodiarrhea? Absolutely. If the patient says, I can't find metolazone at the drugstore, could you use HCTZ? Absolutely. Do you see what I mean? Metolazone probably has the best affinity, but they all work the same way. Okay. So since I brought it up, why would you ever add metolazone to Lasix? Well, I'll cut to the chase and just tell you. <laughs> so you're on Lasix for a long, long time, long, long time. I block all this absorption here. What I do is I massively increase flow to the distal tubule. So after you've been on Lasix for five, six, seven, ten years, what happens is the distal tubule sees all this increased flow all the time. It hypertrophies distal tubule muscles. And this 5 to 8 percent can turn into 20 percent. It's almost like you grew a downstream loop. So people that have been on long-term Lasix, they might really get a real bang for their buck from metolazone addition to their loop diuretic. In fact, such a big bang for your buck, please be careful. You don't want to turn people into prunes. You don't want them to get orthostatic. And this can sometimes be a very potent combination. 
So you get your patient with heart failure who's got an ejection fraction of 25%, and they've got CKD stage 2, and they appear in the ED with 10-plus edema and pulmonary edema, and they've clearly fallen off the wagon. And this has been happening over the last several weeks. And you think to yourself, how did they get into trouble? And they say, Doc, I swear I have not been eating salt. And you go, okay. <laughs> and then they say, I swear I've been taking my diuretics. And you say, okay. I always believe the pills. I never believe the salt. So now they're swollen up like Michelin Man. And the first thing that crosses my mind is they may be taking that Lasix, but it isn't being absorbed. So what I might do is give that Lasix dose IV, bypass absorption, and see if I get a good diuresis. If I don't get a good diuresis, then the next thing that crosses my mind is, gee, do they have enough albumin? And I'll quickly punch in the computer and see if their albumin's okay. If their albumin's okay, then the next thing that crosses my mind is, gee, I wonder if they grew, grew distal tubule muscles. And then I'll throw some metolazone on. Now, I've very simplified, much simplified that, because you also have to think maybe their heart got worse, maybe their kidney function got worse, maybe something else changed. But if it's all about the diuretics, that's the sequence you go through in your mind to figure out what you need to do next that will work. Are we good? Okay. Home stretch. Now we're down to the cortical collecting duct. <coughs> We're out here. The cortical collecting duct uh, really absorbs very little sodium. Um, so this is not what I call potent uh, diuretics at all, but this is where the potassium sparing diuretics live. And this is very handy for people that you're trying to manage multiple comorbidities. So by the time I get way far out here, the amount of sodium I have in the tubule is actually very low. It's somewhere in the 10 to 40 range. And by golly, this looks a lot like this. So I don't have a chemical gradient for sodium to just automatically want to come into the cell. So what I have is sodium channels, little sodium-shaped keyholes. Sodium's a plus. The interior of the cell is electronegative, and sodium comes through there like a bug for bait. Because this is a positive moving across a membrane, I have to spit positives out to keep the voltage uh, uh, level. And the positives I spit out in exchange are? Yeah, so. Potassium and hydrogen. Very good. Those are the two that I spit out in exchange. That helps me keep my voltage across the membrane stable. So what then regulates how much potassium I actually excrete? Well, it would be the number of sodium channels I have open. And what controls the number of sodium channels that are open? P.S. This is not a trick question. Aldosterone, very good. So aldo's out here in your bloodstream. It diffuses through the back door. It binds to an intracellular receptor, and it induces a bunch of proteins called aldosterone-induced proteins. How creative. This goes over here, some of them, to open channels. Another protein goes over there to rev up the sodium-potassium ATPase. And this is a little bit more conjecture, but I think most nephrologists believe it. It also goes to the next door neighbor cell and revs up the proton pump, another way that you're excreting positives. So aldosterone, is this a steady state kind of hormone or is this an all or none hormone or an on-demand hormone? Do you have basal levels of aldo? Yeah, you have basal levels of aldo. So if you're perfectly euvolemic, you still have aldosterone running around your body. And it's enough to keep 30 to 50 to 100 sodium channels open. If I threw you in the Sahara Desert for three days with no water and no cell phone, so you couldn't get help, you would have maximum aldo. And what maximum aldo would do to this cell is give you three to 5,000 sodium channels per cell. So you can imagine how you can suck every last bit of sodium out of that tube and put it back into your body. And it also, I hope, makes you realize why we kidney doctors like urine sodium so much. When I see a urine sodium less than 10, your aldo's on. I know that. And now I have to figure out why your aldo's on. But I can tell you're having an aldo effect. 
the counter-regulatory hormone to ALDO, what turns off those sodium channels, closes them up? I think I've heard it. Not ADH. It's an A1. AMP. Very good. AMP. Atrial natriuretic factor, atrial natriuretic peptide, same thing. These guys bind to a cellular receptor. Second messenger is CGMP. And this causes these channels to shut. Atrial natriuretic peptide was discovered in the atrium. It makes sense to me, too, because if your volume overload in the atrium is stretched, that seems like a really good signal to do something to dump volume. So if I turn on my ANP because my atrium is stretched, I'm going to close sodium channels and I'm going to dump some of the sodium. Is it an effective maneuver? No, but it's something. Um, the last hormone that works here is ADH. And I heard somebody say that earlier. This is not really a diuretic. But ADH binds to a cellular receptor. It induces a second messenger that is CAMP. And this causes all these little vesicles with preformed water channels to fuse with the membrane. These are your aquaporins, if you've read that in the literature. So two classes of potassium di sparing diuretics work out here. Um, what's, where, what are they, and where do they work? Triamterine and amylaride, where do they work? Cool. Sodium channel, right here. Triamterine and amylaride. Oh my god, my handwriting is getting miserable. It's all the marker's fault. Triamterine and amylaride are positively charged molecules that literally plug up that sodium channel. If I have plugged up sodium channels, I'm not taking positives into the cell, I have no reason to excrete potassium. So the sodium ends up in the toilet and the potassium stays in me. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Now since you guys are all internal medicine people, there's two other drugs that are really important to know about because you will see them on a board exam somewhere. They also act as a positively charged molecule that will block the sodium channel. Any ideas? Bactrim. Bactrim, very good. It's the trimethoprim portion of Bactrim. And pentamidine is the other one. Obviously, we don't use these drugs uh, as potassium sparing diuretics, but if you had an HIV patient, not on heart, who comes in with a whiteout and you're pretty sure it's PCP, these are drugs you're probably going to want to pull out. You have to make a mental note that you're going to have somebody whose potassium might be heading up. And you have to deal with that. And if you recognize it ahead of time, it's much easier. Um, the other class, what other, what's the other potassium sperm diuretic? Aldactone. So aldactone or spironolactone and a plerinone. These are the other two. I put them out here because these are worth noting. These are the only diuretics that get into the site of action through the blood. All the other diuretics actually have to get into the tubule. These will work from the blood side. They'll diffuse in here. They'll bind to the intracellular receptor. Aldo can bind, but you never get your aldosterone-induced protein, so you don't get any effect from that. Aldactone is the one we use most commonly, spironolactone. A plerinone is a much, much, much more expensive alternative, but I have pulled it out of my trick box once in a while. Who would I do that for? You want to avoid the Androgenic. So it's the man who gets gynecomastia on aldactone who isn't tolerating it. Especially young men, they're not going to put up with this. And a plerinone really does avoid that side effect, but it's a lot pricier. But it works in case you ever get pushed to that extreme. Um, so, uh, lithium. That's a psychiatric drug, right? <coughs> so, i got to tell you, over the last 30 years, I think the indications for lithium are growing, not shrinking. I am seeing more and more patients who are on lithium chronically. Um, and lithium can cause trouble out here. Lithium can get into this sodium channel. Sodium and lithium look a lot alike. And over time, you can build up a lithium level in the cell. We think that this lithium can poison your ADH receptor. 
ADH can bind, but you don't get your second messenger and you don't get your water absorptive, capac absorptive capacity. So this can be a cause of nephrogenic DI. So if you have trouble like this, what is the one high yield question you want to ask your lithium patients every time you see them if they're getting in trouble with nephrogenic DI? What time of day? Nighttime. I think daytime, people using the bathroom every hour, they can do it on sort of autopilot. But when it's interrupting your sleep, people will remember it. So you say, how many times are you getting up to pee at night? And the patient says, Doc, you're clairvoyant five times. I ain't getting any sleep. And so they have just said to you, I have nephrogenic DI. So what's your first impulse as a physician? Get rid of the lithium, right? At which point, the spouse pulls a gun out of her purse and says, <laughs> over my dead body. <laughs> and I'm being a little dramatic here, but I've had spouses say, you've got to be kidding me. This is the only drug that's ever kept this guy in balance. I really need to keep him on this drug. So can you think of any way where you can mitigate the effects of the lithium, but keep the patient on the drug safely? What if I did one of these drugs? What if I blocked the lithium entry into the cell? This really works. The trick is catching the symptoms early before the patient's peeing every 10 minutes all night. You're not going to be able to change that. But if they're going four or five times a night and you put them on some triantorine, this level over time will drop and their ADH receptor will work better. If someone tells me they're peeing two times at night, that's so much better than five or six times at night. And they're going to get better sleep and the spouse will put the gun back in the purse. Are we good? Questions about diuretics? Yes? Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> they tend to fall in the categories of social misery, a lot of them, and they just don't have great finances. Uh, but you're right, Fumex might be a better choice. It's also scarier, because if you use a potent loop diuretic and a cirrhotic, if you overdo it, you're going to turn it into a hepatorenal and wish you hadn't. So the place to start with cirrhotics is always aldactone, spironolactone. <coughs> uh, it's very gentle, it's potassium sparing, and you can try to keep their volume under control. Why do I not want cirrhotics potassiums to get low? Right? Oh, God. <laughs> 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 no, no, wait. He wasn't saying that in front of me, but I was. Okay. You were telling me. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> um, Because if when it um, goes low, the, it, I forget exactly the mechanism you said, but it makes the body actually produce more ammonia. When you're hypokalemic, it stimulates ammoniogenesis. So not just in the kidney, but everywhere. So you can precipitate hepatic encephalopathy if you're not careful. So you really want to keep cirrhotics potassiums as normal as you can. And now that one's a great way to accomplish both goals. Get rid of a little fluid, maintain potassium levels. What's the mechanism? Hypokalemia stimulates ammoniogenesis in the kidney. Don't ask me why I'm not made it. So look at your patient's bicarb. Frequently, hypokalemia is associated with metabolic hypothesis. <coughs> Doesn't that fit? Mm -hmm. So I can't tell you why God made it that way, but that is the way it is. <laughs> I can't you ask him when I get there. <laughs> <laughs> How presumptive is that? <laughs> Questions about diuretics? Yes. Do you have a specific dose of weight for a period of time that you have to to work, or does it matter what dose of weight? Um, you want to make sure that you're giving them a decent dose of Lasix, and if I'm being pushed to think about Taroxone, that minimum dose in my mind is about 80. Um, and if you get a great diuresis, you might say, whoa, maybe I overshot. And you might. So how would you deal with that? Um, I would, I've done Taroxone Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, once a week. Uh, if your weight goes up by five pounds. I mean, I forgot all sorts of tricks where I get my bank on my buck, but I don't make the patient 
in pre -reading. Any other questions? That was fun, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Shall I just move on to topic number two? Jeeps? Yeah. Okay. Quick break. Quick break. Yeah.